Um, it's a pleasure to have uh, Robert Kenning today. Robert, did I pronounce your name correctly? Yep. Um, so Robert uh, was, a, you know, did his PhD in uh, Cambridge and then moved to Caltech, where we were postdocs together. And uh, beyond this pinnacle of his career, being a postdoc with me, <laughs> uh, you know, he did some really amazing work on. Uh, broad aspects of quantum information and quantum computing. Uh, and frankly say he's one of the smartest people I ever had the uh, pleasure to work with. And uh, now is at the T Technical University of Munich and he will talk about shallow, uh, shallow circuits and how they can give us an advantage. So Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you for this silly introduction. Um, I don't take it seriously, but... <laughs> So, um, okay, let me just keep track of time. So um, it's, it's a pleasure to, um, to present this work here. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, so I would like to talk about joint work with Sergey Bravi, David Bosset, and Marco Tomomicho. Um, so, but let me start with sort of the general um, motivation for this field of quantum computation. Um, as you know, um, we have this long-term vision of a universal fault-tolerance quantum computer and such a device could have various interesting applications, most of which we might not know at this point, but um, here are some, some of the things that are usually mentioned in connection to such a device. So I'd like to comment briefly on one of the oldest and perhaps most famous algorithms, uh, Schwarz factoring algorithm. So this is really remarkable what it achieves. So it solves this factoring problem, problem of finding prime factors of some large integer. And it does so in a time which scales polynomially in the size of this number as measured in terms of bits. So in contrast, the best known classical algorithm for this problem, the number field sieve, needs a sub-exponential time. So this is a huge improvement of um, quantum computing over the best known classical algorithm. And so, so you might now ask whether this is actually evidence that quantum computers are really better than classical computers. And the problem here, of course, is that we are comparing to the best known classical algorithm. And at least in principle, it's conceivable that factoring is actually an easy problem and there's a polynomial time, say, classical algorithm. So in this talk, I would like to ask the question, can we actually prove that uh, quantum computing is more powerful unconditionally without any complexity theoretic assumptions um, for particular problems? Now I should say that of course, and this is not a new field and, and there have been many results that show that quantum computing is more powerful in the so-called query complexity model. So in the query complexity model, you're given access to some black box, which computes some function and you are asked to compute some property of this function. And the figure of merit is the number of queries to this oracle. So you want to ask as few questions to this black box as possible. So this is a very nice model because it uh, gives you a very clear figure of merit. And there are indeed quantum algorithms that are better in this model than any classical algorithm. The problem in this context is, however, that this box is sort of a fictitious thing. So in the real world, we don't have such oracles. And it's not clear whether such an oracle quantum advantage translates into an actual advantage in the real world. OK, so let me just say a few things about what we mean by a quantum advantage. Basically, such a quantum advantage has to contain at least the three uh, following components. So you, you need a quantum algorithm. Um, for some problem. So we want a computational problem um, that we can solve efficiently using a quantum device. So we need a quantum solution in some sense. Now, ideally, of course, this is a problem of practical interest, but I will not emphasize this aspect here. So this is perhaps for future work. The second component is we want that we have some evidence that this problem is actually hard for classical algorithms or classical computing. And as I said, traditionally, this has taken the form of uh, lower bounds on query complexity in the black box model, or sometimes it also takes the form of a reduction to some problem which is believed to be hard. 
Um, so, so then you are uh, relying on complexity theoretic assumptions. You can just believe that factoring is hard, for example. The final component we want is that we should be able to verify that what the quantum device produces is actually a correct solution to the problem. And this is easy for some problems like factoring, because this is an MP, but it's not uh, necessarily easy for all problems that you can solve with a quantum computer. Okay, so, um, so the first result I would like to talk about is a quantum advantage that satisfies all these three properties. Um, it's a quantum advantage that you can think of as an advantage of parallel quantum algorithm compared to parallel classical algorithms. I will define this in more detail um, in a bit. So basically we have three things. We have a way of um, solving this particular computational problem that we propose in a constant time on a quantum computer. We can also show that this problem is actually hard classically. If you want to solve this classically, you need at least logarithmic time, logarithmic in the problem size. Okay. So, so in that sense, you are better off using a quantum computer. And finally, we can also efficiently verify that the solution produced by the quantum computer is correct. Okay, so now I will um, have to introduce this notion of parallel algorithms, but let me just take a step back and, and talk about quantum computing more generally. And please um, interrupt me if you have questions and also tell me if I, I should skip ahead. So I'll go very quickly through this. Um, so we, we're working with n quantum bits. So just uh, so what, what what was the condition on the depth of the circuit that you did you uh, say anything about that for for this circuit or yeah for 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 the result yeah I, I will say this in more detail but uh, it, it's constant depth versus logarithmic depth That's I see okay so just very quickly so we have computational basis elements the first step in a computation consists in initializing the state of the quantum computer in one of these basis states. I will draw one line per qubit, as usual, in the circuit model of computation. Um, a general state is, of course, a superposition of these basis states. Then we can apply unitary gates. And uh, in this talk, I will mainly be applying one and two qubit gates, which are Clifford gates. So here are three examples, Hadamard, phase shift, and control knot. And of course, these gates can be applied simultaneously if they act on disjoint subsets of qubits. So here we have a, a situation where we're acting on the first qubit and the second two qubits and the last qubit at the same time. This is important. Okay, finally, we need measurements. They're going to be drawn like this. So we have an ingoing state here, then the measurement apparatus. And what we get is a sample from this distribution uh, over n bit strings. So we're only measuring in the computational basis. Okay, so quantum computation then proceeds as follows. You put the input here, then you apply these gates in succession. And finally, you measure in the computational basis to get some output. So the whole behavior of the circuit is completely specified by the conditional distribution of outputs given certain inputs. I would like to mention two notions here that are relevant for this talk. First one is the uh, circuit depth. So this is the number of time steps you need to apply the circuit. Within each time step, you have gates acting on disjoint subsets of qubits, so you can apply them simultaneously. So in this case, we have a three depth uh, four circuit. And uh, we also talk about the size of the circuit. The size of the circuit is simply the number of gates in the circuit. Okay, so um, just to be a bit more precise, so what do we actually do when we define quantum com complexity classes, for example? So we have problem instances that are specified by n bit strings. Then we have a classical algorithm which takes as input the length of the problem instance and it outputs a description of a quantum circuit on n qubits, perhaps also on poly n qubits or something like that. Um, so this description then has to be executed using a quantum device. So, so you have to actually follow this recipe that is produced by the classical algorithm um, on input X. So, so you use a quantum device with its input state and then you can read off the solution. Okay. So um, this is a way of defining complexity classes. So now we can impose restrictions on these uh, algorithms in the circuit. So if this classical algorithm runs in polynomial time and 
produces a polynomial size circuit on n qubits, then the corresponding set of problems that can be solved in this way is called BQP. So these are bounded error quantum polynomial time problems. So BQP is a very natural um, class. So it's basically the set of problems you can solve efficiently on a quantum computer. And uh, we know of several examples of problems that are in BQP, such as um, solving linear systems and, and so on. And for all these problems, we actually know that these are not only in BQP, they are as hard as the hardest problem in BQP. So they're BQP complete. So these are good candidates for um, things that a quantum computer can do, but that might not be able to be done classically in polynomial time. Um, then there are other problems which are in BQP, um, but they're not BQP complete. So we don't know um, whether they're as hard as the most general problem in BQP. So for example, factoring is not known to be BQP complete. Okay, um, so BQP is of course the quantum analog of a classical complexity class, the class BPP, the set of problems that can be efficiently solved in polynomial time classically. And the sort of holy grail of quantum computing is to show that these are actually different complexity classes. So obviously BPP is contained in BQP, but the question is whether there are problems in BQP, which are not in BPP. So they can be solved on a quantum computer efficiently, but not classically. So this is um, maybe a conjecture that a large part of our field relies on, um, because um, if it's not true, then um, somehow there's not much point in pursuing quantum computing, apart from the fact that it's interesting, I guess. Um, so why is this problem so hard? Um, if you can show a separation between BPP and BQP, it actually implies a very strong classical complexity theoretic result. This is because we have this inclusion of complexity classes. Uh, so BPP contains the class P and um, B, BQP is contained in P space. So if you separate these two, you actually show that P is not equal to P space. And this will be a very um, significant result in classical complexity theory. So this is something that people have hey, to think about. Hey Robert, can you, you remind uh, me what's the difference between P and BPP? Um, oh, a P, BPP, you can use randomness, basically. OK, um, thank you. Also, uh, Robert, so, so in, in the previous slide, when you said the quantum material simulation or material simulation, what exactly do you mean by that? Um, oh, well, uh, I guess there are different um, things like, um, I guess... Um, Just finding ground state of a local yeah, dimension. Ground and states or also time evolution, I guess. I mean, time evolution is naturally in the BQP and, and BQP yeah. complete. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, B, so BPP, um, you allow, uh, I should have been more precise, but you allow some error, so you want to solve some problem with prob probability two thirds or so, then you can amplify. Um, but you don't necessarily want um, to get a solution with probability one. Um, so that's the difference between P and BPP. Okay, so, so this is a very hard conjecture and this is not what we're uh, aiming for. Um, at least we don't have a good idea of how to approach this. Instead, we're going to consider much more restricted complexity classes and show that there are uh, they can be separated using a problem. Okay, so let me now define these complexity classes. And so what we're doing is we have, again, a classical polynomial time algorithm, which now produces a circuit which has constant depth. So the depth of this uh, circuit does not increase with the problem size. And so the set of problems that we can solve in this way, uh, we call this QNC0. So, th so this is something called quantum mix class. And um, it's the quantum analog of NC0. So these are problems that you can solve with a constant depth classical circuit. So um, this is the two complexity classes that we consider. And we would like to show that they are different. So let me just define this uh, to, to be complete. So, so a classical circuit is just a, sort of a directed graph where the nodes are Boolean functions. Every such function 
or gate take some number of input bits. Uh, so this is called the fanning, the number of input bits. And the output can be copied to many circuit locations. So the fan out, we don't restrict this. So we are going to consider the case where the fanning is bounded. So this is sort of the analog of considering one and two cubic gates in the quantum case. And we're going to consider um, circuits that have constant depth where the depth is defined as in the quantum case. It's the number of time steps you need to evaluate the circuit. We also allow additional randomness, which is independent of the input stream. Okay, so now uh, I can state our um, result. Basically, we found a computational problem, which is a problem from linear algebra. And I'm not, I'm actually not going to discuss this problem in detail. Let me just say that we have this problem and it has certain properties. Okay, so first of all, we can show that this problem can be solved in constant depth uh, with, with a quantum circuit. And the circuit produces a correct solution with certainty. So it's, it's zero error in that sense. Um, also, it is quite nice in terms of architecture. It only uses nearest neighbor gates when you lay out the qubits on a two-dimensional lattice. Okay. Also, we, we, we can verify the correctness of the solution. In fact, this is a problem that you can solve efficiently classically. So this problem is not a candidate for separating BPP from BQP, but it's good enough for our purposes and it can be verified. Okay, so then we have a, a statement about the classical hardness. We can show that any probabilistic classical circuit um, which solves this problem with high probability, say probability larger than nine over 10, um, must have a depth which increases with the system size or with the problem size, it increases logarithmically. Okay, so, so we're separating zero error quantum computation with bounded error classical computation and we see that here we can do it in constant depth, whereas here we need logarithmic depth. Sorry, but, but uh, Rob, you said the problem could be solved in polynomial time. So what, why now do you say yeah. it? Well, uh, I mean, things that you can solve in, say, logarithmic time, um, classically are not necessarily solvable. Um, sorry. Uh, no, I mean, sorry. We, we're not separating something from polynomial time classical computation. We're separating this, this problem, like this quantum algorithm from logarithmic depth classical circuits. Okay. This would be like polynomial time classical computation is stronger than this classical uh, model where you, where you maybe have logarithmic depth, but bounded error. Okay. Because in, if you can solve it in polynomial time classically, um, it doesn't mean that you have a logarithmic depth circuit. You will have maybe a um, a polydep circuit or something like that. Right. So as I said, we're, we're not trying to separate BPP from BQP, but we're just trying to separate constant depth quantum from constant depth classical. Yeah, okay, so, so I'm, I'm just still confused about that statement that at the bottom of your slide, we're still talking about what, there's one problem we're talking about in all of this, the quantum, right? It's, it's just the same problem. This problem. So this yeah. problem you can solve with linear algebra. Basically, it essentially amounts to diagonalizing a matrix, which you can do in time n cubed. Okay. And time complexity is not exactly the same as circuit complexity, so that's also a difference. What, what do you say again? Time complexity is not the same as circuit complexity. Right. I see. More similar. So, so then you say about this problem, you're saying you, you can do this in constant depth quantum circuit. Yes. But you can do it in constant depth classical circuit. But you cannot do it in constant depth classical yeah. circuit. So this is the corollary here. So these complexity classes are um, different. There are there is a problem, the problem that we found, for example, that can be solved in constant depth quantumly, but not classically. Mm -hmm. You need logarithmic depth classically. Okay, so um, yeah, maybe I'll just mention uh, a few follow up works that are interesting. Um, so, um, Dao Cheng Wang showed that you can actually solve this problem using a log square n depth classical circuit. So, up to this log factor, this, this um, bound is sort of tight. Um, Francois Leval, he, he came up with similar um, separations for shallow circuits. And 
And then there was um, this nice work by Watts, Kothari, Schaeffer, and Tal. Um, so they use uh, methods from um, circuit complexity, um, so, so classical computer science, to, to make the separation even stronger so they don't have to restrict the fanning. I'm not too familiar with these techniques, but this is sort of a, a strengthening of, of, of these results. Um, so what I would like to present here is um, not exactly this result, but um, a slight improvement, which is actually sort of the simplest quantum advantage that we know of. So we can do this in one dimension um, instead of two dimension. So with, with local gates in, in one dimension. And um, it, it sort of um, clarifies what, what, what the origin of this quantum advantage is. Okay, so the origin is non-locality. So the fact that th there are entangled states where when we measure, you cannot explain this measurement statistics using uh, local hidden variable models. And, and, and this can be sort of translated into um, this kind of result. And the, so, so, so the, um, the non-locality game that we use is this uh, perez mermin magic square game. So, so let me explain this. So here um, we have two players, Alice and Bob. They are cooperating players and they have to win this game. So the game works as follows. So the referee gives them uh, two questions. Alice is asked to fill in a row of this square. Bob is asked to fill in a column of um, the square and they have to respond with values one and minus one. So we fill in Alice's answers in this row and Bob's answers in this column. And then certain conditions are checked. So they win if the entry in the box where the row and column meet, if they are the same. So this is this last identity. And also if the parities are even and odd respectively. So the product here of the x's should be one and the product of the y's should be minus one. Okay, so th this is a very simple game, but one important aspect I should emphasize here is that Alice and Bob are not allowed to communicate. So this is signified by this wall here. Now, if you think about this, um, they cannot win this game with certainty because to win this game with certainty, they would have to somehow pre-agree on the strategy together um, that, that's allowed, but th there is no strategy that you can pre-agree on um, to win this game all the time. And the reason is very simple. Um, basically, if you try to fill in the square with, with uh, numbers one and minus one, uh, there is no assignment which satisfies all these conditions so that the um, row product is one everywhere and the column product is minus one everywhere because otherwise the product of all numbers would be one and minus one at the same time. Uh, so this is the reason that if you choose random inputs, then Alice and Bob cannot win this game with probability greater than eight over nine. Now it turns out that if they share entanglements, they can actually win this game, even though they don't communicate. And sort of the algebraic underlying reason is that you can actually satisfy these equations if you replace these numbers by operators. So you can ju just use these Pali operators and then you satisfy all this. And somehow this is the basis of the quantum strategy. So let me tell you what the strategy is. So we have Alice up here and Bob down here. And we start out sharing two EPR pairs. So um, two copies of this state. Now if they receive inputs alpha and beta, they can just measure the observables given in this table. So they, um, they rotate uh, to the correct basis and then they measure to obtain their values. So for example, if Alice gets two, she me measures X on the second qubit she has and Z on the first qubit she has. So that will give the value X2 and X3 is then just computed as the product times minus one of X1 and X2. Okay. And you can, you can verify that this can then be one with certainty. Okay, so we have a very strong difference between sort of uh, Alice and Bob without entanglement and Alice and Bob with entanglement and quantum measurements. And we can actually amplify this to a circuit separation between constant and classical and quantum circuits. Hey, Robert, I have a question. Do you know if anybody <clears throat> did an experiment that uh, checked 
uh, on some system that uh, this Perez uh, Mermin magic square? Um, I don't know about this. It's difficult to do it with photons, of course. I right? think it's basically just an entanglement witness. You can construct from just some entanglement witness and then you can measure it. Well, but you need, you need to do, right? Usually with photons, the measurement are destructive and here you want to measure the same object more than three times. Um, no, actually, um, you only have to do two of these measurements because the third one is always um, de dependent on the other two, so you can compute it. So, so like for example, in this column, you just have to measure x on the second cubic and z on the first cubic, and then the eigenvalue here will just be a product of these two times assign the same. Mm -hmm. So it's actually you can do destructive measurements. And I'm sure this has been done. I, yeah, I, think, I think you can, it's just probably equivalent to, to measuring some expectation value from the entanglement witness. Yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, it, it, it's, it's so, sort of um, a variation of a Bell experiment, which is a bit more complicated than CHSH because you have two EPR states. But, um, otherwise, I think, yeah, but that's a good question. I should maybe look up some, some reference. Um, um, I don't know. Okay. Okay, so, so um, maybe then I'll continue. So, so now um, we want to somehow amplify this difference in a way. And so here's sort of the, the, the intuition or, or the strategy we follow. So we'll now give you a quantum solution to a problem that I'm going to define later on. So basically this is going to be, um, the solution will define the problem. So instead of starting with two EPR pairs, we're going to start with many EPR pairs arranged on a line like this. Okay. Now we're going to do intermediate measurements on so consecutive pairs, namely so-called entanglement swapping measurements. So this is um, these are just measurements in the Bell basis. Okay. And then um, we assume that the inputs are provided at the top and the bottom. So we have alpha and beta, row and column again. And then these qubits are measured using this table from before. Okay, so, so this is the um, quantum solution to a certain problem um, I'm going to define. But let's just analyze what happens here. So if you do this entanglement swapping measurements first, you could imagine that doing them first, then Basically, what happens is you're creating long-range entanglement between these qubits and these qubits here. Well, uh, Robert, what exactly are you swapping with what? Um, entanglement swapping is just a different term for doing a Bell measurement. So you're measuring... Ah, you're just doing, yeah, okay, you're just doing a Bell measurement of the, on this uh, two cube. This, right. uh, and by doing this, you're basically entangling... So if you do a Bell measurement here, you're entangling this pair with this pair. And then if you do a Bell measurement here, you're actually entangling um, this pair with that pair. So you end up creating long range entanglement. And in fact, the state that you get once you measure these destructively is again, two Bell pairs, except that they might be slightly corrupted by some Pauli um, correction operation. Right? I mean, normally if you do this entanglement swapping measurement, you should apply, apply some Pauli depending on what measurement outcome you got here to actually recover the zero, zero plus one, one state. Now we, we don't do this, we just uh, do this entanglement swapping measurement. And what we can say is that the resulting state is um, two, two copies, uh, I mean, two states of this form where the Bell state that we have, it's one of four Bell states each, is determined by the product of these measurement outcomes that you've got here. Okay, so, so this is just, um, um, yeah, very basic computation. Um, so that's the post measurement state when you do this entanglement swapping measurements. And the important thing is that it depends on uh, these intermediate measurement outcomes through these products. Okay, so now um, in the next step, we will do this uh, magic square measurements. So this looks like we're playing the strategy of the magic square game, except that we're using the wrong state here. So let me modify the magic square game. So let me define a magic square game where the input here in the strategy is not the state zero, zero plus one, one, but these states, phi sc and phi s prime t prime. Then um, 
what happens is that these parity constraints are the same and um, this equality constraint that we have in this box is modified. Uh, sorry, Robert? Yes. Uh, can you define what is this, uh, what is the notation you use for the, for the best, uh, basis, this phi uh, S and T? Um, this, this is just... Ah, um, oh, it's this? Okay. Yes. So you're applying parallelism on one side of the state. And, um, sorry, I guess S and T, I should have said there. Um, zero, one. Uh, no, sorry, is that one? Minus one, um, minus one, one. one. Yes. Sorry? They're just minus one and one. So minus one and one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Right. <laughs> I should have said this. Okay. So, so then, um, so if you, if you apply these magic square measurements um, to, I mean, if you use this resource state instead of the standard uh, resource state, then you're actually sort of um, winning this game, which is slightly modified. So you have, instead of equality here, this product should be a function of um, these, these values S, T, S prime and T prime. And this is given by this table. Okay, so, so why don't you just rotate uh, the remaining qubits? Um, uh, like, yeah. you, you, you cannot do that because you would have to communicate all ah, the yeah, so results to one point. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, so we, we don't want to do that. Yeah. Okay, so now, um, so, so, so now let me actually define um, um, the problem or, or, or actually give you a circuit that solves this problem. So, so we're doing the same thing as before. So here's a quantum circuit. And I'm claiming it does the same thing as before. Um, namely, this part creates a bell pairs. I mean, we have these Hadamard gates, and then we have entangling gates between neighbors. And then we have some um, entanglement swapping measurements. So this is just a unitary on these four qubits, and then some computational basis measurements um, on these blocks of four. And then we have these magic square measurements, which are just controlled unitary. So you rotate into the correct basis, and then you measure in the computational basis. OK, so you see this is a constant depth circuit. Um, in steps, is, you can see that it's constant. And also, all the operations are essentially local in 1D. So we arrange the qubits on a line, and all the gates are essentially between nearest neighbors. OK, so the question is, um, what problem is solved by, by the circuit? It's exactly this problem here. So this is now a new problem where you have to output not only x and y, but also these intermediate uh, values, s and s prime and t prime. And then you have to satisfy these conditions where s is given by this product, s prime is given by this product, and so on. Uh, how do you input the fact that you cannot communicate between the parties as in a computational? Um, no. we, we put it into the yeah. definition of the problem. So the, the definition of the problem is such that we check this condition on this product. So, so, you, so mm. you don't have to produce this product. You just have to output these values. And then the verifier, the, the referee, actually takes this product and checks whether this is one or not. Mm. Mm. Okay, so, so now I'm claiming that this problem, you cannot solve it using a 1D local constant depth uh, classical circuit. So, so this is just to, to give you the intuition, we, we're restricting to geometrically 1D local classical circuit, which looks something like this. So we are given alpha in some place, and then we have a line of um, these wires, and then we have beta somewhere else. And suppose you have a classical circuit like this, then what you can see immediately is that, well, um, the bits that can depend on this input alpha are only the bits that are located here in what we call the light cone of this input bit. Okay. And all the other bits, they cannot depend on alpha, the same here. The only bits that can depend on beta are in this light cone. And because this is constant depth, this light cone is of bounded size and they're disjoint. Okay. So now you can think about which of the outputs can depend on alpha and beta and how. So you see x can only depend on alpha, y can only depend on beta, and these intermediate bits, let's say the bits s1 up to some uh, number of s's, uh, they can only depend on alpha, then you have some that don't depend on alpha, and then you have some that only depend on beta. 
But when you take this product, you see that basically you get the product of two functions, some function which depends on alpha and some function which depends on beta. Okay, and the same is true for all these other products. And so, so in this way, you can argue that whatever circuit, classical 1D local, constant F circuit you use, you always get a very limited dependence of these values, S t, S prime, T prime, on um, the inputs alpha and beta. And essentially, you can just explore um, the set of all these functions, because now you're essentially dealing with, with Boolean functions. And um, so this is a little bit like exploring the Bell polytope and showing that um, you cannot violate the Bell inequality. So, so in this way, you can show that you cannot win this game. Um, you can also phrase this a little bit differently and say you can, you could, if you have a strategy here, a circuit that does this, then you could actually get, um, you can win the magic square game, which you know you can't classically. Okay, so that's uh, the intuition. And um, then you can actually make this problem slightly harder by randomly choosing the location of this alpha and beta. And in this way, you can actually also argue that um, this is hard for any constant at classical circuit with bounded fanny. So it doesn't have to be um, of this nice geometrically 1D local form. It can be, it can include non-local gates. Okay, so this is how we get this um, result. So this snowball theorem is, is um, um, based on a probabilistic argument. So you, basically you show that for any circuit you fix, um, there are instances, um, polynomially many, that, that you cannot solve um, using, using this circuit. And, and, and the argument goes through these light poles. Okay, um, so um, as I said, somehow I think this is somehow one of the simplest um, examples of a quantum advantage because in, in the sense of the, the quantum requirements, this is a very um, nice circuit, it's, it's just one the local, you just need to work on a line of qubits. But of course you can ask, is this actually relevant? Because um, here we assume that this circuit has no errors at all. Uh, so, Robert, one more question before you go on. So, uh, the, the first circuit that you showed, then it, is it true that it has um, uh, that if, if you if you restrict yourself to nearest neighbor classical gates, then the classical circuit has to have a linear number of gates, not a polynomial, not a logarithm. Um, yes. Yeah, so basically, what you need is that these Lycons intersect. So, so it's a linear number of. Uh, yes, but in, in terms of depth, it means logarithmic. That's how we get this law. Because, like, oh, no, I guess, sorry, if you restrict to 1D local architectures, it's linear, you're right. Okay. Um, right. If you don't restrict to local, it's basically logarithmic, because then you can go from anywhere to anywhere else in logarithmic depth. Yeah, if everybody can talk to everybody, yeah. That's right. So that's just uh, sort of, I mean, that's why the result is ultimately a logarithmic depth bound. Um, but um, yeah, but the other thing is linear. Okay, so, so we have this result that says constant F 1D local circuits are more powerful than constant F classical circuits. And now you can ask, okay, um, can we actually go into the lab and do this? And the question is, of course, um, can you still see this advantage even if the circuit is noisy? And I think the, the, the quick answer is um, no. I mean, this is not going to work. You cannot just um, run the circuit and expect to see anything useful. Okay, so we have to actually um, do a bit more work and we can show that um, even noisy constant F circuits are more powerful than constant classical circuits. But for this, we need a different problem. And we actually, um, so far, the best architecture we have is 3D local. So we need um, gates that are local in a three-dimensional lattice of qubits. Okay, so um, I'm going to um, now explain the second um, part. And the first thing we have to do is we have to fix the noise model that we would like to consider. Um, so, so basically, if you have such a circuit and you try to run it, everything can be noisy. So um, idealized, we can say, well, maybe preparation gates and uh, measurements, as well as memory locations are noisy. And one way to model this is to just introduce additional error operators, say 
after each gate or before measurements and so on. Now, we're going to use um, Pauli errors for this purpose. So there's already an assumption that goes uh, into this model here. Um, we're assuming that somehow probabilistic Pauli noise is, um, is, is capturing uh, what we have in the lab. And of course, this is not accurate for, for many systems. But um, there are some arguments that, that maybe this is, this is enough to consider Pauli noise. And for surface codes, we also have some numerical evidence that somehow um, coherent errors are comparable to um, Pauli errors if you use a sort of Pauli twirl. But of course, this is a, a point you, 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 you can like or dislike, but, but it's sort of a standard model in fault tolerance to just consider um, Pauli errors that are random. Okay, so the second assumption we use is that the error model is in a sense local. And what do I mean by local? Um, we're going to assume that high weight Pauli errors are exponentially suppressed. So if you have a Pauli error that acts in three qubits, then it has um, lower probability of occurring than a single qubit um, Pauli error. And this is just sort of motivated by physics. And, and, and I should say maybe um, locality um, should be understood here in terms of weight. So um, this can be acting on qubits that are far from each other, but we are we're just restricting um, the probability of high weight errors. Okay, so, so, so basically the error models that we are going to consider are of this form. So for every um, configuration of Pali errors on these wires, we have some probability. And these probabilities have um, this, this form that they're somehow exponentially suppressed um, for high weight errors. And more precisely, we use this notion of local stochastic noise with strength P. So this is going to be the notation. So E is this random Pauli error. This is just uh, a random variable on the Pauli group. And we are going to make the following assumption. So P, P is what captures the noise strength. And the assumption is that for any subset of qubits, the probability that all of these qubits are affected. So this support is the set of qubits that the error acts on non-trivially. This, um, this probability for any fixed subset is um, exponentially small in the size of this subset. Okay, so this is called local stochastic noise of strength P. This was introduced by Aliferius Kodosman Preskill and has been analyzed in, in detail, for example, in this um, New York paper. It's a nice model because it um, allows you to capture the noise strength using a single scalar parameter P and it actually um, encompasses a lot of natural models. For example, the case of IID noise, where you have independent noise on every qubit. Um, but this is more general because you can have dependencies between errors on different wires, for example. Okay, so um, of course um, you can argue about errors in, in some um, simple ways. For example, you can think about which qubits are affected and say that the support can only grow, so it, it sort of accumulates. Um, and um, you can also propagate errors through gates and argue about how the support changes. Um, for this local stochastic noise, you can actually make these relations a bit more precise. So you can, for example, take a local stochastic error with rate P and one with rate Q, and then give a bound on the parameter um, of this product. So this product is again going to be local stochastic with an error rate which is somewhat larger than P and Q. Also, because we're working with Pali errors, we can commute um, errors past uh, Clifford circuits. And for example, if you have a depth one Clifford circuit or just a Clifford gate, then you can say that the resulting error when you commute an error forward um, is again of a related noise strength which can be slightly larger because we're considering um, one and two qubit gates. In, in any case, there's some calculus for these local stochastic errors, and this is going to be helpful. Okay, so let me now define what we mean by a noisy implementation of a circuit. So here's the small print, but I'll just give you a picture. So this is the ideal circuit which we would like to run. Now what we can do is we can just insert errors we're going to assume that there are errors um, 
basically after this preparation step and after each gate and so on and before the measurement. And the only assumption we're going to make is that these are local stochastic. And for simplicity, let's assume that the parameter of, uh, P is the same for all of these errors in each of these layers. Okay, so I should emphasize here that these errors, they can be correlated in space, as I mentioned, but they can also be correlated in time across different time steps because all we are assuming is that the marginal distribution is local stochastic with error rate p. So, so we're just um, making an assumption about the marginal distributions of these errors. Okay, so how do we analyze this? Um, I mentioned that we can propagate errors forward and accumulate them and we can sort of update the noise parameters. So one simple thing we can do is we can propagate everything forward and just have an error happening before the measurement. And of course, the noise rate of this error is going to be much worse if you apply the lemma from before, but we can relate it to the noise rate um, of, um, of, of this model here. And as long as the depth is not too large, then um, you, you still get some bound here that is useful. How do you commute it through if, if uh, you're, you have non-Clifford gates? Oh, then you can't. I mean, yeah. Um, oh, so, so you're assuming these are the blue are Clifford gates? Yes, we are, we're only working with Clifford gates at the moment. I mean, you, you could probably do, um, for example, uh, you could replace non-Clifford gates by magic um, state teleportation and, and then just use a Clifford circuit and so on. I mean, uh, ultimately, you want to go away, get away from Clifford gates, right? That, that um, well, then you just have a resource state, which is non-stabilizer uh, instead of a non-Clifford gate. But anyway, in this talk, I'm only using click for gates. So. Okay. Um, okay, so, so, so this is just to say that um, this complicated situation we can analyze um, by considering um, this kind of situation where we just have a local stochastic error happening before the measurement. Okay, so now I can state um, this second result. So basically, we have a complicated problem which we can solve using a quantum circuit, even if the implementation is noisy. Okay, and we can solve it with very high probability, say 99%. Of course, this only works if the noise strength is below some threshold, phi you know. I mean, this is sort of a standard um, thing in, in fault tolerance. I mean, you cannot expect to be able to tolerate any, any kind of noise, but there's some threshold, which is a constant, and um, as long as you're below that constant, um, even you, you can get the right result, even with noise implementations. And, and the circuit, as I will show, is geometrically local in three dimensions. Okay, and the same problem is actually hard for classical circuits. So here we have a depth lower bound, which is log n over log log n. And this applies even if you apply, allow fanning gates which I found in poly logarithmic in N. Okay. So this on the classical side, we don't have any error model. I mean, we're assuming that the errors, the circuits are noise free and, and, and still we get this separation. So even noisy quantum circuits are more powerful than noisy constant um, classical circuits. Okay. So I guess, do I have like 10 more minutes or so? I can... Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so I'd like to explain a few of the techniques. So obviously we're going to use error correcting codes and the code of choice here is the surface code. Just before that, so, so Robert, so, so this problem, you're going to basically, just that I understand, you're going to solve it using only Clifford gates? Um, right? Not exactly. They they are they happen to be classically controlled Clifford gates, which is a subtle no. detection. Okay. You, you you can think of them as just Clifford gates. I see. Um, okay. Okay. So <clears throat> um, so so in quantum fault tolerance, um, you normally use some error correcting code. So this means you you take a qubit and you um, add some ancilla qubits and you isometrically embed it into a larger system of qubits, for example, in the ground space of some local degenerate Hamiltonian. 
and the toric code is of, or surface code is an example. So here we have a qubit on each um, of these edges. So these are these balls here. And um, this is a good code. We have large distance, which grows with the system size. So in particular, if you have errors, then you can still recover from these errors. So for example, you can apply a decoding map, such as this overall thing is um, roughly the identity. So we know the surface code can tolerate um, independent poly X and Z noise with uh, probability 11% on each qubit. Um, we can also tolerate coherent noise. And of course, various other error models have been considered. Now, um, so, so error correcting codes are sort of the, the building block for fault tolerance. But let me now argue that we cannot use standard constructions from fault tolerance directly. Okay, so what's, what's the standard procedure in fault tolerance? We have some ideal circuits, which we would like to run on our device. And to run this in a way that tolerates noise, we recompile the circuit into a larger circuit, which adds redundancy. And so every gate, for example, is replaced by some fault tolerant gadget, where we, where we do some operations on the physical degrees of freedom and do some measurements and error correction and so on. And so this recompilation ensures that um, on the logical level, you, you're still executing this ideal circuit. So in particular, um, from the output of this larger circuit, you can compute uh, a value which simulates this ideal circuit. So you can sort of approximate, say, in a long distance, the output distribution of this uh, ideal circuit. Now, the problem here is that um, this is all nice and um, established, but um, you have a certain blow up when you do this recompilation. So in general, I mean, you're going to need more qubits, but also you're going to increase the depth. And this is actually significant. So the state of the art in this field is, uh, is, is probably this paper here by Fauci, Grosbelli, and Leverrier. Um, so what they can show is that the blow up is constant. I mean, you just need um, a linear number of qubits here. Um, in terms of qubits, but the depth is actually scaling with the size of this original circuit. So this means that even if you have a constant depth circuit here, if you do this recompilation here, you don't end up with a constant depth circuit. And we want to do something with constant depth um, circuits for um, several reasons. So, um, so, so we cannot directly plug in these fault tolerant, um, fault tolerance constructions. Okay, so instead, um, we're going to do something slightly different. So basically, um, we have a procedure for making a problem fault tolerant. So the difference in some way is that we're not actually making the circuit fault tolerant, we're replacing the problem by some fault tolerant problem in a certain sense. Uh, some of the building blocks are the same, of course, we're going to encode every qubit in an error correcting code. But now the error correction, which is typically a polynomial time classical algorithm um, is going to be put into the relation. So this um, relates to a question that Nate had before. So you ask about the communication you need and so on. This was also put into the relation, but now we're actually going to put the error correction also into um, the relation. Okay, so um, I will tell you about um, some of the techniques now. <clears throat> and some of these techniques are uh, a standard, um, but um, we're going to use them in a particular way. So one thing we need to be able to do is we need to be able to operate on this encoded information. Suppose we have some logical state encoded in, in the ground state of, say, the surface code or Tori code, and we want to apply some logical unitary to it. And the way we want to do this is we would like to act on the physical degrees of freedom. So we like to act on, on, on the lattice and do something on these qubits to um, realize such a logical gate. So if you like, you can think of this as asking uh, for a certain diagram to commute. Um, what's important here is that we would like to do this in a constant depth because we, we sort of want to stay with constant depth circuits also because then we can control the error propagation. So basic question here is which of these gates can be realized in this um, manner? We call these protected gates. So protected gates are logical gates that have a constant depth implementation where we act on the physical degrees of freedom. 
So there are um, some results about what gates you can do. For example, we know that um, if you have stabilized occults then, um, and, and they're local in D dimension, then any gate you can do belongs to the so-called beast level of the Clifford hierarchy and so on. Um, so there's sort of positive and negative results. Um, the only thing that matters for us is that we can do, for example, a logical Z gate. You know that in the Tori code, basically you have to apply Z along a strip, or perhaps you could use this diagonal here. So if you apply a Pauli Z to every one of these qubits, then you've implemented a logical Z operation. And you see this is a constant depth circuit. It's in fact a depth one circuit because you can do this simultaneously. Now, logical Z is not enough. We would like to do other gates as well. It turns out if you fold the surface code in this way, so you fold along the, along the diagonal, then you change the locality relation. So suddenly these qubits are now neighboring in such a way that you can do additional gates. So, so then you can suddenly do all um, Clifford gates in this, um, in this code using local operations. So this, this is in this paper by Mosson, this is a, a very nice trick that, that we exploit. Okay, so um, the next thing we need is we need to be able to read out um, the logical information. And um, the way we want to do this is we want to do this fault tolerantly. So typically this is done by measuring some qubits and then doing some classical computation to figure out what, what the result should be. And in the surface code, we can actually do this. Um, so even if you have a local stochastic error, um, with as long as the noise rate is not too high, we can actually um, measure the logical Z operator with high probability. So, so with exponentially large probability in, in the cold distance. So yeah, maybe, I mean, um, just to explain this very briefly, so um, we would like to measure the eigenvalue of this operator, this logical Z operator, which is a product of this single qubit um, Zs. So the nice thing would be to measure each of these qubits um, with Pauli Z and then take the product. But this is not very good because we can have, say, bit flip errors. And if you have an odd number of bit flip errors on this diagonal, then you would end up with the wrong answer. Now, the problem here is that we cannot observe the location of these speed flip errors, but we can measure the, say, the pocket stabilizers. You're going to see that these are violated because they have one um, error acting on the boundary. If you go to the dual lattice, um, you see a bunch of defects. You can match them up using some um, matching algorithm to each other or to the boundary. And then you can say that these are actually, uh, you can pretend that these were the actual errors that happened. If you com combine this with the original errors, you're going to get the effective error, which is the error plus the, this correction operation. And now what matters is whether you have an even or an odd number of these edges on the diagonal. And this is just some algebraic condition, which you can check and then um, you can do combinatorics to get the bound. Okay, so um, I don't have too much time left. So let me explain the last <coughs> item. So we need a way of preparing um, encoded states. So how do you do this? Um, if you forget about fault tolerance, there are various unitary and um, non-unitary circuits and so on that achieves this. By the Robinson bounds, we know that you cannot do this very fast in the case of the surface code, say. Um, you need a time which scales or a depth which scales with the system size. Um, there's also an interesting um, paper, a newer paper by Aharanov and Tuati, where they allow um, non-local gates, um, but you still need um, a logarithmic depth. So this is not good if you want to work with constant depth circuits. So we have to actually change um, our goal slightly. So we're going to um, demand that we are preparing not um, a surface code state, but the surface code state up to a Pauli correction which depends on measurement outcomes you got from ancilla qubits. So we're going to have some ancilla qubits. We're going to use a shallow circuit. Then we're going to measure these ancilla qubits. And this measurement result determines a Pauli correction, which would actually give us an encoded state. So the nice thing here is that we actually do this with a constant depth circuit, a depth six circuit.
<clears throat> now, if the circuit is noisy, then um, <clears throat> you cannot actually get an invalid state. But what, what we can do is we can sort of commute these errors forward, and we get some local stochastic error here. And we can relate this to a situation where we have a local stochastic error on this ideal encoded state. So we can bound the noise strength of this error. <clears throat> so this shallow quantum circuit is again some sort of Clifford circuit? I'm going to show it now. Yeah. And also, and, 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 yeah. But, but also I mean, the, the depth of this shallow quantum circuit would scale with the, num with the number of qubits in your target. No, the depth is constant. It's kind of independent of the of the number of qubits in your target. Uh, it's a it's um, yeah, yeah surface code. It's a depth fixed circuit. In, yeah, okay. <clears throat> I mean, naively you could just take um, you, you could just say, okay, um, let's measure all the stabilizers of the surface code, right? And then we do some correction operation. I see. But that's that's actually not what we do because that will not be fault tolerant. Yeah. Okay. So we, we're going to use some beautiful result from this paper by Rassendorf, Bravi, and Harrington. Um, so if you take a three-dimensional cluster state, which you generate by Clifford operations in uh, constant depth. So this is this uh, three-dimensional lattice of qubits. And now we're going to measure all the red qubits in the Pauli X basis, all the black qubits in the Pauli Z basis. And we just leave these yellow qubits alone. Then what happens is you end up with um, two surface codes in the front and in the back, and an encoded spell state up to a Pali correction, which depends on these measurement outcomes. Okay, so this was shown in this paper, and they also showed that this procedure is, in a sense, noise tolerant, so they were interested in long range entanglement, and um, they showed that even if you start with a thermal state, in some sense, of these qubits. Um, you, you still get um, the right recovery operation. So you can determine what, what encoded pulse state you have on the boundary. In their situation, in their analysis, they assumed that uh, the operations on these uh, qubits in the front and in the back were um, error free. And we can extend this to the case where all the operations are, are noisy. Okay, so we actually need the folded surface code. So um, we start with this architecture where everything is folded over along the diagonal. And with this measurement pattern, you, you get an encoded bell pair, um, which depends on the measurement outcomes you got in between. Okay, so then um, you, you just put this together. Um, all we needed was encoded bell pairs. Um, we have logical, so, so we can replace every bell pair we needed before by such a, a prism. And then along these boundaries, you can use um, this uh, protected gates to entangle and do entanglement swapping um, measurements and so on. And in this way, you can actually take this um, scheme we had before, which is not, not um, noise tolerant and make it fault tolerant, but you end up with a 3D architecture. Okay, so um, this is it. Um, well, I, yeah, I wanted to comment on the difference to what we call quantum supremacy, um, which is sort of um, aiming for a stronger result, but usually based on some complex theoretic conjectures. Maybe I will skip this. And yeah, so that's the summary. So we, 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 we can show that noisy, um, constant depth quantum circuits are more powerful than constant depth classical circuits. And I think there are various interesting um, questions now. So for example, one question is, can we do this in two dimensions instead of three dimensions? And perhaps there's even a, a no-go um, result in, in, in that regard. Okay, so with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. So I still see there's some survivors. Um, so we, let's see, let's open the floor for questions. The audience. Can I just advertise something? So um, we are yeah. organizing QIP next year, and we've recently decided to move everything online, unfortunately. But um, 
So the, the, the dates have also changed slightly. So the submission deadline is in November and um, the date of the conflicts are, are here. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Yep. So, so, Thank uh, you. Uh, so, questions? Uh, I have a, a really stupid question, which will only expose my ignorance. So, since in principle it is not possible to satisfy the, the uh, um, Paris Mermin magic square, should I understand the moral that once you allow long range correlation, which corresponds to this? logarithmic depth, then you can solve the Mermin Perez magic square. Is this, have I understood what you told us or, or completely not? Yes, yes, I think this is, uh, this is entirely correct. Um, so we, we, we are generating long range entanglements, quantum correlations that are long range. And these allow us to solve this extended magic square problem and classically, you can do this. I mean, you're not generating this, the necessary long range entanglement. So you're still constrained by locality, even in this circuit setup. So I think that's. Thank you. Robert, so I have a question. Where are all the. So in, in the classical circuit that you're comparing to, mm -hmm. uh, where did the logarithms come from? Uh, I mean, I understand that if you would. Yeah, so if you, if you, I understand why it would be linear if you restrict completely local, geometrically local circuits, but. Um, yeah, it's okay. I, did, I didn't show you this part of the argument, but um, the reason is, is exactly because we want to, um, essentially we want to make sure that um, certain light cones are disjoint. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so we might not know that one light cone is up here and down here, they might be all, all over the place. But if you choose alpha and beta randomly, I mean, this is also an addition we do, mm -hmm. then you can show that at least for some of these locations, the corresponding light cones are going to be disjoint. Okay. Yes. And this is basically, so if, if you assume that you have less than logarithmic depth, then it's because the light cones cannot cover the whole mm -hmm. uh, set of bits. Somewhere you're going to have some, some gaps and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so this is a fundamental limitation, I guess, of this approach. Um, I mean, it would be nice to have arguments that go beyond logarithmic depth, but um, mm. that yes. seems to be hard. Um, mm. So if you have any ideas, I would <laughs> like to know. Um, so so, so, so the, like establishing stronger separations too. Right. But is there an intuition for the log, why log and not the n to the square root of n or some? Some other thing, or oh, it's difficult. Yes, I think the intuition is that um, in logarithmic depth, if you apply, if you allow arbitrary two local gates acting on two qubits, then in logarithmic depth you can reach all the all the output bits. So, so you cannot. So, if you if you go beyond logarithmic depth, then you can not apply no signaling type arguments. To, to, to show something about the circuit. And that's that's what we're doing. We're, we're applying no signaling arguments, say, to say this 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 can depend on this input and so on. So that's why I, I think we get this logarithmic um, depth thing. Thank you. Thank you. I think yeah, it depends on the architecture you consider. But if you just uh, allow arbitrary two qubit gates between any pair of qubits, then it's logarithmic. And otherwise, it's linear, as it, it has said. So. Uh, right. Do you, so, uh, can you remind me? So, what are the uh, uh, like the uh, the upper bounds you have from classical algorithm to, for these uh, problems? So, do they? Uh, yes. So, I think the the paper by Dao Cheng Wang um, he considers this other problem that we had first, the hidden linear function problem. And for, for that one, the upper bound was log square and... I see. And does, do you have any, any classical result for the noisy? No, I think this, that's one of the open problems that's mentioned, mentioned here. So, so the, or is, it, is that what you're referring to? I mean, I think it would be nice to know when this breaks down, this advantage. 
Okay. So, because it's not the same problem as the, as the noseless problem, right? No, it's, yeah, it's a different problem. Um, but but uh, I, I assume that similar techniques uh, can be applied. I mean, basically what, what he does is he, um, he uses the fact that these are essentially linear algebra problems. I mean, because we're working with Clifford uh, circuits and so on. And then there are some circuits to do linear algebra. That, that I'm plugging in, in both this. So, so I assume, well, at least for the noise-free case, um, this 1D thing, you can also give a classical um, circuit, which has maybe log square in it. OK. OK, thanks. So I have another, I mean, are there any other questions from the audience? So I have another question. So I think I just missed, at some point you discussed, uh, you wanted to do two things to commute. So having first, you know, the gate and then the encoding or the, yes. can, you, can you go over that again? I, I'm not sure I... I, um, I mean, it's just a kind of trivial thing. So if you, um, if you have an error before, um, before the symmetry, it's equivalent to having yeah, that, that, two dagger E, U, F. Sure. So you see that the, the support increases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, no, but, yeah, but I, I think maybe if you go one, maybe one slide forward or a few slides forward. Uh, is that what you mean? So, so no, so, no. I think I was referring to a different slide. Uh, um, where uh, maybe uh, this this question here. Okay. Is, is no, no. The, uh, go 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 forward. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, more. Uh, go, go more forward. At some point, you showed this kind of diagram where you um, you wanted stuff to commute. Oh, yeah, yeah, this one, yeah. Mm -hmm. What were uh, you trying to say here? Okay, so um, I mean, suppose you have something encoded in the surface code, and you want to apply a logical Z operator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so one thing you could do is you could just say, okay, um, we decode, so we we expose the information. Then we apply a single qubit z, and then we encode again. Right. Yeah. So this is a terrible thing to do because right. you're um, you're losing all the fault tolerance. Right. The coding step. So instead, mm -hmm. what you want to do is you want to do something directly on this physical qubit. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you apply z along a line of qubits. Mm -hmm. ah, I see. Immediately go here. Yeah. So it's um. I see. Yeah. Transverse. Uh, they don't have to be transverse. It would be enough if they're constant depths, but um, yeah. in, in fact, they are transverse in this case. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. So, so, and then you're saying that somehow you, you can encode any number of qubits into into a surface code with a constant depth circuit if you. Kind of up to correction, up to kind of poly corrections. Is that is that? Um, no, you're actually. I mean, you're only encoding one qubit in one surface code. Yeah, right, right. No, so, so, but in 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 a surface code of arbitrary size. Oh yes, that's right. In a, in a, you're saying in, in a constant depth of six or something. Yes. So so basically, the, the circuit you have to first generate this 3D cluster state. So this uh -huh. is initializing every qubit in plus, and then. Um, the C phase gates on, uh, on on all the edges on all neighboring qubits, and this you you need I don't know you need like um, I mean you have to do this in, in succession right even vertical odd vertical yeah yeah I see okay mm -hmm. yeah okay and then you just measure the red and black qubits and you're done mm. so that that's how you get this depth fix I see. Uh, and then that actually creates an entangled state between two, two surface codes. Yes, between the yellow in the front and the yellow in the back. And you think somehow this also has some fault tolerant, I mean, some... So the fault tolerance property is that even if this, um, in this paper, they just look at the case where these intermediate qubits are noisy, mm -hmm. so the red and black qubits. Mm -hmm. And um, so what you do is you have to, compute a correction operation that, um, or a different way of saying is you have to compute what 
what the Bell state is. But, um, this this computation is um, this function is somehow noise tolerant, so you can have a few errors, but um, in the end you're, you're doing some matching also. Um, it's just a matching in three dimensions. I mean, it's a little bit like decoding the um, surface code under um, noise in, in the syndrome measurements. So you also talk about the 3D lattice. You repeat the measurements in time. So you can think of one direction as time, but that's yeah, it's just an analogy. But I think this is sort of also the um, motivation for this one way fault tolerant computation thing. I mean, they also use this sort of architecture. And the reason why you like this and you don't want to just measure stabilizers is that, well, there's two reasons. One, you actually want to create an entangled state, right? To, to you're using that, right? Um, and, and then you're saying somehow measuring the stabilizers wouldn't be, wouldn't have any fault tolerant properties. Um, yes. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the problem is that we, I mean, you, you want also the, um, the measurements to be noisy. I mean, the, it should also work if the measurements are noisy. Yeah. And, and this is some other difficulty. So if you just take the surface code and you want to, like, let's say we have a large surface code and you want to create long range entanglement between two patches of the code, mm -hmm. you can actually do that using um, very similar measurements. I mean, you start with some graph state. Everything is two-dimensional. We do a lot of measurements, but then it's not clear how to make this noise tolerant. So if yes. your measurements are noisy, then it's not clear how to decode properly. Um, and this 3D, 3D cluster state somehow has this fault tolerance. Interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is a very beautiful paper. Yeah. And, and uh, when you think about this folding, you don't actually think of, you don't actually have to think about a physical folding. The question is, this, is a, this, this folding is physical. I mean, we, we are um, arranging the qubits in this way. But in what, in what sense? I mean, what does it affect the fact that you're folding it? So the fact that you're folding it, if you think about transverse gates, I mean, it's just on the level of the surface fold. So <clears throat> there are. Um, gates where you have to act, say, on this qubit and this qubit with a two-qubit gate. And in this architecture, this would be a non-local gate. But if you fold it, then you get additional gates because you can, these are now neighboring qubits. Are you allowing to do an entangled measurement on these neighboring qubits or what, what are you allowing that's not allowed when you unfold it? Um, uh, a gate which acts on these two qubits, a unitary gate. So in this, oh, sorry. in this architecture, these gates will be far apart from each other. So if you want to act on these qubits, you would have to somehow swap this to make it differing. And then this will not be constant depth anymore. I see. So if, you, if you're restricting to, to just local, geometrically local gates, that's, that's between the years, then that... Yes, that's what we want here because, yeah, the operation should be easy to do. So. Why is that? A, why do you need to have local, kind of geometrically local gates? That's part of your conditions of the. Easier in the lab, supposedly. Uh -huh. But it's not part of the condition for your computation problem. No, I mean, um, it's, it's a feature of um, our quantum solution that we can actually, we don't need non local gates to show this quantum advantage. Mm -hmm. In particular, the, the, the classical circuit can be non local. Um, yeah. So that makes the results stronger. And I think it would be nice to reduce this further. Like I said, I mean, ideally we want to do things only in two dimensions mm -hmm. with local operations. I mean, folding it might cause all kinds of non-local errors to occur. I don't know if that's a problem or not. Um, so if you really just start thinking about physically kind of folding it. Yeah, but I think it's okay because we, we're talking about these local stochastic errors and even if they're um, yeah, it, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, we're only interested in the weight of the errors. Okay, you're not interested in, in the geometrical locality. It's in, in, in the error analysis. So um, even if you have uh, now suddenly correlated error between these two qubits, it's somehow in the analysis, it doesn't matter whether these qubits are next to each other or far apart from each other. 
what is what is the uh, the threshold of the noise in this uh, local stochastic? Oh, I don't remember. It's it's in brass. Yeah, is it like ridiculously yes. small, or is it like something more or less? It's, it's ridiculous. Um, but oh. but this is because it's a it's an analytical bound. I think it's like I don't remember. It's like ten to the minus forty or something. Um, but the point is like minus how much? <laughs> I'm not saying it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, I, I guess the point is, if you really want to try this, you should uh, probably just um, simulate this using the Cottesman Mill theorem or so, and, and then you yeah. you can estimate this um, this threshold much better. It's probably not so bad, um, but but of course, yeah, our result is just a proof of principle. You know, to show that there is a constant um, below which this works. Right. Um, other questions? Okay. Um, so, all right, thanks for presenting the really beautiful results. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. It was and, good to uh, see you. See you soon, hopefully, again. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Okay. So, thank uh, you. Bye.